OK, so let's uh, ha look at uh, an introduction to data science. And this will be used to build a basic foundation for understanding how we use uh, data with cybersecurity. So in the presentation, we'll look at uh, some basic combinations and permutations of, of data. Then we'll look at uh, basic sets and how we can uh, understand uh, the membership of these sets. And then on to probabilities of events and uh, Bayes' uh, theory. So in cybersecurity, we often uh, use probabilities to be able to assess how probable something is. So it might be that something is highly probable, and then when something happens that's not probable, that could point towards a security threat. Then we'll have a look at how we can correlate uh, numeric data using correlations, and then on to distributions of data. OK, so let's have a look at combinations and permutations. With combinations, we'll look at the number of time, the number of options that we can have from a set uh, so that we don't have any, uh, any repeated values. So in this case, we might have uh, four different countries, UK, France, Germany and Ireland. And we're looking for the number of three uh, sets of three uh, countries. You can see it might be this, 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 and and this. So from a three, from four, uh, we'll see that we get four uh, different combinations there. And we can work this out with this formula here. Uh, four factorial is four times three times two times one. Five factorial is five times four times three times two times one, and so on. So from a 4 from 3 from 4, we have 4 factorial divided by 3 factorial, and then 4 minus 3 factorial in this case to give us 4. But we can also look at the number of permutations, and, and in this, in this uh, uh, case it matters, which, uh, in the, in, it matters in which position uh, each of the countries would come in. So in this case, from a 3 from 4 for permutations, we might have this, 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 and, and so on. In this case, there's a formula for this, and it's the number of options divided by the number of options minus the number we want to select from. In this case, it ends up at 24 from a 3 from 4 for permutations. Luckily, Python has a, a mass library uh, which allows us to do uh, factorial calculations so we don't have to do them ourselves. So let's have a quick look at this uh, code here. Okay, so from uh, 3 from 4, uh, we run this factor, there's our factorial function. In Python 3, we can use this, this data format here for uh, adding our, our uh, variables into a, a string. And we'll do our calculation and see what we get. So there's our 4 and 24. We can change that so that we have 5. Any 3 from 5 is 10 and 60 for the number of permutations. OK, and we can print these out. In Python, we can define our sets in this way. So this is a set created, our data set. In this case, there are four countries. And then we're going to apply uh, this, uh, these functions from this library and to be able to work out from a three from the number of options in there for combinations and for permutations. This will, will provide back the results of the multiple entries. And if we want to iterate around them, we can use a for loop and it will pick off each one of the options one at a time. So again, we'll look at the code uh, for this. And there we go. So we can see there's the 4 there, and there is the 24 for the number of permutations. We could add another country on, and this will give us a 3, 3 from 5 option. Okay, so in this case, uh, so for the combinations, we have this. So there are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, as we saw before. And I think there's 60 different permutations here that we get. OK, we could change this here to a 4 if we wanted uh, to be able to do any 4 from 5. And we can see that Python 
reduces uh, the uh, the the uh, the manual work that we have to do for working out these things there. Okay, so there's a four from five, gives us five different options there, and there are a number of uh, uh, permutations there. Okay, so often in cybersecurity, uh, we will look at the probability of something happening because we need to understand uh, what's the probability that a user will log in uh, at the weekend and if the probability is, is different to what we see, then that might be seen as an anomaly. So probabilities themselves uh, are, are calculated. So from the roll of a, of a dice, uh, the probability that we'll roll a certain number is 1 in 6, or 1 divided by 6 gives us that. We can also use this notation here, which is not. So the probability that it's not a 6 when we roll it is there are 5 different options of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 divided by 6. So we take the number of options that, that are, uh, are negative in this case and divide it by the total number of options and give that. But that plus that should equal 1. If we have two options uh, together and uh, two, two, two events which are independent, then we can use an AND uh, operation. So the, with the AND operation, we can take the probability of A and multiply it by the probability of, of B. And that will give us our overall probability. So if the probability that it's going to be uh, sunny uh, is, is, point, is, is a half, and the probability of it being humid is, is 1 over 4 or a quarter, then the probability of it being sunny and a humid is, is an eighth in, in there. So this is the AND uh, operation here. We can also have an OR operation. And with OR operations, if they're independent, then we can add them uh, together. So the probability that we'll throw a 1 plus the probability that we'll throw a 2 will be 1 over 6 plus 1 over 6, which is 1 over 3. Or the probability of throwing a 2 uh, or a 3 is one third in this case. We can also use this operation uh, here uh, for uh, independent uh, uh, variables. So the probability of A and B is equal to the probability of A multiplied by the probability of B knowing the value of A. So this representation here is the probability of A knowing uh, uh, something. So this is when we have uh, a, a dependent variables. So let's look at uh, sets and how we can uh, represent our data sets. So the, the basic symbols that we use uh, are these. So if we draw a Venn diagram with uh, two uh, two sets, or so we might have set A and set B, then this part here represents the uh, the intersection between A and B. For this one here, we have the union, which will be all of this. So everything that's in A and B will be uh, joined together. We can also have a subset uh, of, of this. And if we want to represent that something belongs to something, then we use this symbol here. So in this case, Mike belongs to players, but Ian does not belong to players. So here's an example here using Python. So we can define a set with the square brackets or the, the curly brackets in this case. And then we'll use the, the basic uh, function, a basic intersection function, a union function, along with a difference function here uh, to be able to understand the, uh, the different data sets. So in this case, X has got Dell, Apple and SecureWorks. 
Y has got Google, Apple, and Microsoft. And we'll look at the the code uh, for this. Okay, so that's intersection, so that's the and, that's the union, the joint one, and then this will be the difference between the two of them. Okay, so as we can see, uh, the intersection is apple because they both contain apple. The union will be all of the values together, and the difference is the, the things that vary between them, uh, between x to y, in this case, it's these two uh, values, is the difference between x related to y. Uh, if we change the case here, it will see it as a different object. And we can see now there's no intersection there uh, between them. And now the union has a new uh, value with the lowercase value there. Okay, let's look at uh, Bayesian theory, which will allow us to to uh, fairly complex operations on our probabilities. So let's take an example uh, here uh, in terms of uh, Bayes. So with Bayes, uh, we work at the probability of A knowing B. So we know that B has happened. What's the probability that A will happen? And that's equal to the probability of B knowing A uh, multiplied by the probability of A and divided by the probability of B. So we'll take an example of, say, the weather, sunny, overcast and raining, and also of uh, there being clouds or no clouds. Let's say that the probability of it being sunny is 0.3 from here, and the probability of there being clouds is 0.2. And let's say we've observed that when it's sunny, the probability of there being clouds is 0.5. We can now work out the probability of it being sunny, given that there are clouds as 0.5 multiplied by 0.3 divided by 0.2. And overall, that will be 0.75 or 75%. So let's take an example here of uh, a, a log which contains a number of hacks. So there are 15 entries here, four for production, five for R&D and six for sales. And these were the recorded hacks on each. So we can work out for sales, there were one, two, three uh, fishing attacks. And then for production, there were one, two. And then for R&D, there were one, two there. So overall, there are 15. So we need to make sure that uh, all these values here tally up to 15. So that's 5, 7, 8, 9, 10, 15. So that's OK. Now we'll take, uh, we'll find out the probability of A uh, by summing across here. So 3 and then 1, 4, 5, 6. Then 6 divided by 15 it gives us 0.4. Here it will be 4 divided by 15 to give us 0.267. And then 1, 2, 3, 5. 5 divided by 15 gives us 0.3. So the probability of uh, sales being uh, recorded as a hack is 0.4. R&D is 0.33. Now if we go down the columns, 3, 2 and 2, then if we take that, that's 5 and 7 divided by 15 gives us this value here. And then 3 divided by 15 is a fifth, which is this value. And then 5 divided by 15 is a third, which gives us this value. So the probability of phishing is 0.467. The probability of a crypto crack is 0.2. And the network a crack, a network attack is 0.33. So now we'll calculate the probability of A uh, given B. Okay, so 
let's say we want to determine the probability of sales, given that it's fishing. So we look here down this column and we can see there are seven, seven attacks on fishing. So three of them are on sales. So the probability of sales, given that we know that it's fishing, is 0.429. Then we'll look here, and it's 2 divided by 7 fishing attacks gives us 0.86. And then for Andy, it's also 2, so we get 0.86 here. And we can go through and we can tally up each of these, uh, each of these values. What we should find is that uh, the tally here, when we tally them up, we should get 1.4.4.2. We should get 1 uh, because that covers all of the, uh, the attacks. Now what we want to find is from the calculation, the Bayes calculation, the probability of fishing given that we know it's sales. Okay, so for that we'll bring back our, our table here because we need to work out some probabilities of A and B and we'll bring back our table the probability of A knowing B. From there we want to calculate the probability of B knowing A. So what's the probability of a phishing attack knowing that it's sales that's been affected? So for that we bring back our, uh, our Bayesian theory. So in this case uh, the probability of uh, of sales knowing crypto, sales knowing crypto, and we'll multiply it by the probability of crypto, which is 0.2, and then we'll divide by the probability of sales, which is 0 0.4 there. So it's 0.2 and 0.4, and we get uh, a value of 0.167 for that. So we can go through each of these. Uh, so the probability of uh, fishing will be the uh, for sales will be the probability of sales uh, given fishing uh, multiplied by the probability of fishing and then divide by the probability of sales. So in this way we can actually work at uh, the probabilities uh, of of the attacks, uh, knowing the uh, the system that's under attack. So we can see here straight away that if we know that it's production, it's a 50-50 chance it's either a network attack or a phishing attack. If it's AND that's been affected, we know that there's twice the chance that it's phishing or crypto rather than a, a, a network attack. Okay, so from this we can work at fairly complex uh, probabilities so we often use this in terms of uh, a prediction, uh, using a prediction uh, engine and uh, Naive Bayes can be used to be able to integrate uh, and make predictions on things. So in this case we're going to analyse some email messages for whether they are phishing emails or not. So we'll take the number of characters in the subject field and the number of words in the email and then we'll classify whether that is seen as a phishing email or not. So we see here, uh, this defines yes, 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 no, 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 no. Okay, so these ones are classified as uh, as not, as having, uh, just to check, as having, uh, as, as not having, uh, uh, as not being uh, phishing emails. And these ones are so these ones are defined as phishing emails, and these ones are defined as not being phishing emails. Okay, so we have an X and we have a Y, and what we want to do is use uh, Bayesian uh, logic to be able to fit that and make a prediction. So in this case, uh, we make a prediction here, and the result gives us a zero, which means that uh, it does not is not fishing. This one is predicted as a one. This one is a one. So these two are fishing, could be predicted as fishing emails, and these two are are not. 
if, so you can see from here above then the phishing emails look as if they've got a higher value there okay so this is the classification for phishing and these are the classifications for not uh, phishing as defined uh, by that okay so we can run the code here and see how we get on uh, we'll be covering uh, machine learning later on in the in the presentations but for now we'll just uh, use the this method to be able to make our prediction using using a uh, bayesian methods okay so here we are so these three are classified as having uh, our phishing emails and these ones are classified as not uh, having it so the one thing you can notice here is that these are relatively large uh, values in there. So we use a, a, Bayesian, uh, an, a Bayesian method to be able to score and, and predict. And then when we run this, then as we saw before, uh, it makes a prediction uh, based on, uh, on these probabilities that are generated. Okay, so there's the results. So these three were classified as phishing emails. These these four were not. And then we make our prediction uh, in there. So for the first one, uh, no. And then the next two, yes. And then the last one, uh, no. And in, in this, we define the uh, different states that that we that we might be in, and then we work out the probabilities uh, as we come out of each of these states, and we create what's called a directed acrylic uh, graph. So in this case here, we have a, a diagnostic system for for a car with battery. Uh, the gauge for fuel, whether we can turn over the engine and whether it can start or not. So as we work through, we can work in the probabilities. So in this case, uh, we have the the probability that uh, we can that we can't turn over the engine and and the battery is good as 0 0.03, and if the battery is bad, then it's 0.98. In this way, we can actually go through each of the probabilities and work out what is the most likely uh, a, a probability as we go through each of the states by knowing things. The more we know, uh, the more likely we are to make a, bit, a good decision. So now let's look at uh, correlation and, and often what we have with inside our data analysis is to be able to correlate uh, something to something else. So this might be a simple single variate problem. Uh, it could be that we have a, 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 a variable x and we observe y and we're trying to correlate the y to the x value. So it could be a linear equation or a quadratic uh, a, equation. Uh, more commonly, we might have a number of dependent variables x, y and z and we're trying to link them uh, to an output, say W in this case. If it's a numeric calculation, we might come up with an equation which could relate to it. This is what's called linear regression and to be able to link uh, uh, variables to mathematically to an output. So some of the correlations that we might have is, is a straight line and uh, that's a linear correlation. Uh, we might have a square function we might have logarithmic. Uh, there are many different uh, functions, even sinusoidal in it. But what we're really trying to do is to map uh, y to x and find the variables. But we might have multi-dimensions multi that we have to map against. And it's not just two uh, variables. So what we have is typically a strong positive correlation or a strong negative correlation. 
a strong positive correlation means that the variables are fairly well correlated to each other. And when we measure them, we do see that generally uh, there is a, a, some uh, correlation between the X and the Y, the, uh, the, the independent variable and the dependent variable. So you can see generally in this case, whenever we increase the infant mortality rate, we're increasing the heart disease uh, rate here. And this gives us the trend here uh, for a linear uh, a correlation. Over here, we see a, a negative correlation. As we increase something, we see a decrease on it. It's still a correlation, uh, but obviously it has a negative effect uh, on the output. And then we might have little correlation where we have almost random data and there is no correlation between uh, the, two, the, two variable, the two variables themselves. So what we need to do is to be able to analyze uh, these, this data. So let's take two uh, variables here, smoking deaths and homicide death rate. And we'll just see if these are correlated. So often we can see with our eye whether there's a correlation uh, between our variables. And in this case, there isn't a great correlation there. You can see it's fairly random and we've tried to estimate uh, from here. But there are certain statistics that we can use to be able to see whether this is a good correlation uh, or, or not. Again, one of them is Pearson's coefficient. So Pearson's coefficient is, is this uh, p-value that, that we see. Uh, and if we get a p-value of minus 1, there is a negative correlation, very strong. Uh, one, minus 1 is, is perfect for a negative correlation, or we get a p-value of plus 1, means a positive correlation, the strongest we can get. If it's between uh, 0 and plus 1, we get some correlation in there, and between minus 1, we get some negative correlation, and if we get a value of 0, it means that we have completely random uh, points and there's no correlation between the two. So in this way, we can measure the correlation. So here are some uh, examples here uh, of the kind of clustering that we might get. So that's a perfect cluster here and here. So the Pearson is one or minus one. In between, we get more dotted, but then when we get zero, we see this randomness uh, factor in, in there. Okay, so here's an example here. Uh, of a correlation. When we run the statistics, we get what's called the R-squared uh, value here. So as we'll see, R-squared is used fairly often in cybersecurity for looking at the, the correlation. But we can also have the F-statistic in there that will give us uh, a, a, an analysis of how good our model is for, the, for it to be uh, fitted. Okay, luckily, uh, pandas in, in Python allows us to be able to uh, understand these, these correlations and to get some statistics uh, from them. So this is an example here uh, where we take a correlation and it's giving us the, uh, uh, some statistics about the data set that uh, we have. In this case, we have a normal distribution so as we see in the pandas, there's also a correlation function that will give us the correlation between uh, one uh, data value and another. When we look at Splunk, we'll see that there is a value called the R statistic, R squared statistic, and that gives us a measure of how well uh, correlated uh, the data is. And here are two different values here. This has a better R squared uh, value than this one here. And we also measure the root mean squared error, which is the total squared error uh, uh, across all of our data. And we can see here that 
it's obvious that the root mean square error is less in this case than it is in this case because there is much more variation, much more error in those values. Okay, so also we get our distributions for our data. When we take our samples, uh, they will fall into certain uh, known uh, distributions. So for example, if we took an, an experiment and we measured all these values, when we actually plot out the frequency of the values that we've taken, they will often come out in terms of this type of shape. This is what's known as a normal type distribution here. And for this, we often look at the average, the average value, and then for the standard deviation. And this will measure uh, the, the, uh, the variation of the data that we get. So for a normal distribution, uh, so this is an example with a, a mean of 10 and a standard deviation of 2. You can see that the data is more tightly plaqued and this one is an average of uh, 10 and with a standard deviation of 5. So with a standard deviation, uh, this is the measurement that 68% uh, of all the data fits within side one standard deviation of the of the mean. 95% is then used for two standard deviations and 97% for three standard deviations. So in this way we can actually uh, see what's normal. So the values here we can see there's 34% that way, 34% that way. We know that 68% of all our data will fit within inside this, this region uh, for the one standard deviation. Then 95% of all our data fits between two standard deviations that, that we have. So out here, we could actually define, out with the, the 95%, we could define that this could be an anomaly and something looks a bit strange when we're out there. Okay, so if we take a, an example here. Okay, so we might have uh, an average of nine and then a standard deviation of say four. And we can replot to see what the it looks like, and this is our normal distribution uh, here for that. If we have a smaller standard deviation, we should see a tighter uh, distribution. Okay, we can also do what's called cumulative. So we just keep adding up the frequencies until we get a shape that looks like, like this. So this takes us to 100% uh, here, eventually, as we keep increasing from there. So this shows a different, the different uh, profiles with the different uh, standard deviations that, that we have. And then there are other ones that we can get. We can get a chi-squared, uh, which will look like this, this type of uh, uh, shape and uh, this type of uh, curve is defined by the degrees of freedom as a as a measurement and we can have the Laplace which looks less curved and much tighter together uh, for the data values much quicker decay than we would see with the with the Gaussian one and if we look at this one uh, what we'll do is we'll run some Python code for this one. And so Python allows us to be able to plot our values using the, the math, math uh, map plot. We're using NumPy, so we'll cover that in a future unit. And then we're going to uh, generate some uh, random Laplace samples uh, to, to fit in with that uh, a distribution. And then what we'll do is we'll plot it. We can also save it as a file if we want with the save uh, fig there. So we'll just give that a run. And so we're using mu of nine and sigma of two here. And we'll just see what that looks like. And we can just vary 
our values as required. There we go. And uh, we can also get the a saved PNG of our of our values. What we get is a number of uh, we generate a number of samples uh, for our, our random data and we can also get a number of bins. So the bins will actually be the size of these little uh, rectangle bars that go up. And obviously the more bins, the, the more it will look like a smooth curve, where if we have fewer ones, then we're obviously putting them into their frequencies uh, in there. Okay, each time this one runs, we'll get different samples because it's using random data that fits in with the profile of the distribution. So here are some of the other ones. This is what a random, uh, a random generator would, would, would look like. Uh, for that, uh, this is a normal distribution. We can get triangular, and this is wheel wheel, and this is our uh, exponential distribution here. So we just have a look at these, and we'll generate some Python code to be able to run these, and we'll see the power of using Python uh, now. Okay, so uh, we'll generate our random values for each of the different types of curves and we'll define a, a, a mu and a sigma standard deviation uh, a variable here. And then we'll just run this. Uh, we can vary the number of bins here if we want. To make it smoother. Okay, but generally this, you can see the trends for the curves there. Okay, so the random should be flat eventually. This is the normal distribution. Triangular one looks like that. And there's the, uh, the, wheel, the wheel bill. Okay, so that's been an introduction to uh, data science.